Big time today, I was told. But I'm glad you could come. And you know, how many of you know that God makes no mistakes? He, he, knows, he knows where we'll be and what's going on. So when he gives a word, he wants to speak it to us and help us. If you missed Thursday night where we talked about launching out into the deep, there's something going on in God. How many of you know that God wants you in a greater place than you are today? One person believes it. Let's try that again. How many of you know that God wants you in a greater place than today? I'm not one of those trick people. I don't ask questions to see if I can catch you out. Uh, but I've been in churches where they do that. The teacher, particularly teachers, they'll ask you a question. They know what they want you to say, and you can never say the right thing. So I'm not like that, all right? If, I, if I'll get a prophecy for you, I won't ask you if you can have it. I'll just give it to you. Is that good? So uh, wave at people, because we're being wise right now. Wave at people. And please be wise. You know, wear masks if you can. I know some people don't believe in it, and that's fine. But whatever you can do to make somebody else feel comfortable, let's do it. Is that good? All right. So um, I've got a favorite comedian. And of course, you can tell by my accent that I wasn't raised in uh, Texas. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, it's very interesting when I go away and preach. People say, uh, all the way. I don't know why people do that here. All the way from San Antonio. And then I get up and they think, well, he doesn't look tall enough to be from San Antonio. And then I, I talk, and they say, well, that's not a Texas accent. So I say, it is. It's just East Texan. 5,000 miles east. And so um, <laughs> I got a favorite comedian. His name is Michael McIntyre. Uh, tremendously funny if you're, if you're British. Uh, if you're not British, you probably won't get the sense of humor. But, but he's tremendously good at mimicking people, everybody. And he, he's telling this story one day about his wife. And I don't know how he lives at home after the things he says. When he's, I don't know if his wife just says, I'm not watching you ever again. So he, he, he said one day his wife said to him, Michael. And he said, oh, no. She said, I am at the end of my tether. And he said, oh, dear. He said, the problem with this tether you never know when it's going to be at the end. So he said to her, well, what did I do? And it was a little thing, I think. It was about the dishwasher. She had asked him if he would put things in the dishwasher, and he didn't put things in the dishwasher. And so she said, no, no, next to the sink is not the dishwasher. And so she's pouring out the end of her tether. She's at the end. And, um, and so, like uh, an idiot, he says, well, there is, is there anything else? <laughs> and so we go for the next 10 minutes on the other things that brought her to the end of her tether. Now, the end of a tether is very interesting. It, it, it's not just a British saying, but you, 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 can, you can be tethered, a, a horse can be tethered, a dog can be put on a lead, and, and a tether is, is that which you are, are given room to move in. And when you hit the end of a tether, there's nowhere else to go, you see. Um, and sometimes we all hit the end of our tether. Sometimes you can hit it spiritually. Sometimes you can hit it physically. Sometimes you can hit it emotionally. Um, sometimes you can hit it in sickness. Uh, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from, you're, you get there. And sometimes God's in the end of your tether. Sometimes he lets you go as far as you, you want to go where you are because he wants to actually pull you up a level, but you won't go up a level, so he just lets you hit the end of your tether. So, and that's literally what it means. I've just hit the end. I, there's nowhere else I can go. And, and, and if you pretend it never happened to you, you just lied in church. Right. You know, There's nobody in here I see with uh, halos. And if you do have them, they slipped a long way. Every person is real. That's what I like about God touching people. It doesn't matter who it is. They're just a real person. I remember Robert saying during the conference, he said, they put their pants on the same way as I do. We're just people. And, and God allows things to go on in us sometimes or causes things so that he can bring us to another level. So I, I, I'm going to talk to you about two people who came to the end of their tether. One is found in Luke chapter 5, and it's a fisherman. 
And it's a fisherman called Simon, who we know as Peter, and he's Simon Peter. And it literally says in Luke 5, 5 and 5, 6, he says, Master, I've toiled all night, and I've caught nothing. In other words, I can't do any more. It doesn't work. And if you've ever served God or if you've ever been in a job or if you've ever been at school, there are times where you feel like there's nothing more you can do. You tried. Sometimes, unfortunately, that can be a marriage. Sometimes that can be a parent. I, honestly, uh, God was so good to me about my father. I did not get on with my father until he got saved. And he didn't get saved till I got saved. In fact, when I got saved and I told him I was saved, he said, what is saved? And he'd been at church for 22 years trying to find God, and I got saved. And when I got saved, Dad got saved, and Dad became a different person. But, but I, I could not please my father whatever I did. If I was the fastest runner in the school, I wasn't fast enough. If I play, I play for every single school team. I'll, I'll just tell you what it was. I played cricket for the school. I ran for the school. I dove for the school. I swam for the school. I played tennis for the school. I played soccer for the school. I played rugby for the school. And it still wasn't good enough. Because that generation, the way they encouraged was to say that wasn't good enough. They'd come through the Second World War. That, that was the way they made it, by jiving each other to go further. And, and you, you can get to the end of your tether pretty quick that way. And I began to say as a young man, it doesn't matter what you do, you can never please anyone. When I married my wife, I came into the marriage with that attitude. Oh, well, you never please her either. You can never please the headmaster, and you'll never please the pastor and you'll never please the, the military that you went, and you'll never please anyone because that's how life is. I'm at the end of my tether. But God was good enough with me to allow my father to live a long time and for it to be restored. So all of us have lived things that took us to the end of where we could go. We're at the end of our rope, if you want to use that word. I like the word tether. You're tethered to God, and he's not going to let you go where you're going, he wants to take you where he wants to take you. I've toiled all night. I've tried everything. And I caught nothing. God wants to do something about that, but he's got to get you to face that. Sometimes I is far too big in our, our words. I have toiled all night. I have worked so hard. I've tried everything. And the Lord wants to get in among that. The second one, the second story I want to take you to is found in 2 uh, Corinthians in chapter 12. And in verse 8, this is what Paul says. I actually, every now and then, like the King James. We, when I was uh, brought up, it's a few weeks ago, I was brought up in England before the old monetary system changed. So I was brought up in England when you used to have pounds, shillings, and pence. All right? And, uh, and when they changed the money to the decimal, they devalued the money so fast that everything changed. But there was a, a monetary, so there was 240 pennies to the pound, all right? And so you used to have uh, 12 shillings to the pound, 12 pennies to the, to the shilling, all right? Just going to give you something. And, and, and there, was, there was two monetary things that were there. There was the, the penny coin, which was this big. There was the half penny coin, which was this big. There was the sixpence that was the size of, your, you know, your dime. And there was something called a threepence. Now, if you want to speak real English, say this back to me, threepence. It doesn't exist anymore, but if you had a threepence in your, in your pocket, it was made of brass, and it, and it had about nine sides to it, and it was a threepence. And I like the old King James every now and then because it speaks like that. And, and in here, it, it literally says that, that Paul says to the Lord, he said, Lord, King James, thrice, don't you like that? Thrice, three times, I have asked you. What's he asking you? Lord, there is a, a messenger of Satan buffeting me. I'm being beaten down. I can't take it anymore. I'm at the end of my tether. 
And I'm asking you, Lord, how come I'm your servant? How come you have not stepped in to help me? I would have thought first time I prayed it was good enough. But no, thrice. And suddenly the Lord answers him. He said, you're not really with it, are you? You write in the New Testament and you don't know my ways. You haven't figured out that my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is perfected in weakness. And in other words, I can't do with you what I would do with you if you stay in control of it all. So I'm allowing you to come to the end of your tether. In other words, that means everything you know, Paul, doesn't work. Every confession you've made, every statement, you know, you've heard people, and, and I believe all that. You, you confess things, you stand on the word, you, and yet it didn't work. And nothing's working. So the Lord brings him to the end of his tether, to the end of his rope, so that he can suddenly find out that God's got an answer at the end of it. Now, it's very important that if you ever come to the end of your tether, for instance, my wife got fed up with me a few years ago. You would never know that, knowing my personality, that anybody could ever get fed up with me. And she got so fed up with me that she took me to the altar. She didn't, I mean, she didn't grab me by the collar. She didn't even tell me till she'd done it. All I know is she said, I can't deal with you anymore. So she went above my head to my head. And she put me on the altar. She said, Lord, I can't deal with this side of him. I'm handing him to you. I'm handing on the altar. I'm at the end of my tether. I can't do it anymore. (laughs) She hands me on the altar and lets me know afterwards. It felt ominous. In French, it felt dangereux. And it sure was. Because when she came to the end of her tether, she invited him into something that only he could fix. She couldn't reason with me. I don't even know what it was about now, but she'll tell you. If, uh, you know, but, but if she tells you, then you have to pay me because you have the knowledge. <laughs> but whatever it was, she'd had enough. We all live that, my friends. But what we do when we get there is what counts. What the Lord wants to do is what counts. And so watch this. Paul brings the Lord into it. He said, I'm at the end. I don't know what to do. I need your help. I invite you into this situation. I'm at the end. Have you ever done that? No cleverness, no quoting, no scripture. Help. What does Peter do? Peter's toiled all night, he cleans his nets, he leaves his boat empty, and then Jesus offers to get into his boat. Will you let Jesus step into the vessel of your life as he is, not as you want him to be? So watch this, one person invites him in through prayer, another one lets him step in. The moment you let him in, anything can happen, I'll show you the things that happen. But this is bigness because the moment someone bigger than you gets into your vessel, guess who's in charge? And one of the things for us Western people is we don't like someone else in charge. You know, you even feel like when you're driving through one of these drive throughs when they say, have a nice day, you almost want to say, don't tell me what kind of day they have. I'll choose. We're like that, aren't we? Don't mess with me. It's my life, really. It's your life on loan. Watch this. That's called breath. If he ever stops letting you breathe, it's not your life. And sometimes we need to be big enough to invite someone in that's bigger than us and stop telling him what he should be doing in our lives and start saying, Lord, it doesn't seem to be working. It says in Psalm 102, I believe verse 22, 21, 22, it says, in the midst of my years, he broke my strength. Why? Because my strength was in his way. So it's very important that, that you, you literally invite him. I think it's Proverbs 3, verse 6 says this. You know, trouble with, when you were brought up in London, I don't know if you know this, but they, they don't pronounce their H's. So I was, I, I was brought up in a, in a town called Hemel, Hempstead. 
It's 25 miles. It's really Bernie to San Antonio downtown. That's how far away I live. But they don't, the people from London don't pronounce their H's. So it's M Empstead. See? And, and also they don't pronounce their TH's. So every time I say three, I really want to say free. You catching that? So every now and then I, I, I notice and I'm speaking and I say to myself, no, pronounce the TH. All right? It's like, it's like uh, this guy gets out of prison and he's running out, out down the streets of London. He's shouting, I'm free! I'm free! And he shouts it more, I'm free! I'm free! And the little boy stands there sucking a lollipop, says, that's nothing, mate, I'm four. <laughs> Please get a sense of humour, it's all right. <laughs> I know it's an English joke, but you got it now. All right, she got it, she got it, this is good. But we, we need to understand that when Lord saves you, he doesn't save you for your convenience. When the Lord saves you, he saves you for his purpose. Yes, amen. And, and will allow your tether to be stretched or your rope to be stretched until it's at the end so that you will let him be God in your life. Amen. And I'm telling you as a church and as churches and as people, this will happen again and again. But if we get this that we're about to do today, things will change in our lives. We'll go up a level, my friends. Uh, I get visions. You know that I get visions. And one day I, I had a vision. And I was standing in a, in a hotel, and, I, and actually I remember it to be a hotel in Houston. And uh, this hotel that I particularly remember went up 15 floors. And suddenly as I'm walk, I stood outside the room, and in this vision, the, the elevator stopped right in front of me. And the door opened. And when I looked, the arrow was going up. And I knew the Lord was saying to me, I don't want you to stay on this floor, I want to take you further. But we like comfort, don't we? So here comes the tether. Here comes the end. So that he can take us to a higher place. So, so Peter had to let him in the boat. Paul had to pray. And these are very imperative moments. Because we're inviting the great one to move. All right? Now what the Lord answers uh, Paul is very, very deep. He literally says, no, Paul, Paul, my, listen to the word, my, not yours, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, that word sufficient is a deep word, but it actually means it, it can sustain and it can fulfill and it can ward off. In other words, when my grace gets involved with the end of your tether, it can do something in you that you can't do in you at all. I brought you to the end so that my grace, not your grace, not what you own, but that which I own, that which I have released, my grace is sufficient. Now, the moment you touch that, it means that it's sufficient for anything. But what happens to us, because we are, we, 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 you know, we're self-trained and we're self-everything, what happens to us is, is that very often we don't use grace the way we should because we're still doing it in our own strength. And so he says, look, my grace can handle any matter, can fulfill any matter, and can ward off any attack. In other words, my grace can ward off that buffeting, but you're still relying on what you think you know. So I want my, the sufficiency of my grace to step into the situation that you are now in. All right? My strength, my, and the word there is dunamis or dunamis, whichever way you like to pr pronounce it. My power, my power that, that operates, that raised Jesus from the dead, the Son, it works in weakness. Jesus is dead, I raise him. Weakness, strength. You're catching it. The weaker you get. Now, the word weakness there is really interesting. You've got to hear this because we're probably all being very spiritual. You look spiritual. You know, you're sitting there saying, I feel that this is touching a little area of my life. So <laughs> the word weakness here is very important because it means weakness physically, 
emotionally, morally. It means that when I've come to something in my life that I am not able to overcome, and that can be emotions, that can be a time of life, that can be anything that you're going through. It could be the strain of exams at school. It could be relationships. It, your emotions are thwart. Right? What did it to me? I'm just going to tell you the truth. Someone walked in to, up to me, Madge, and she said to me, she'd been praying for me ever since that I caught Epstein Barr or caught it flared up. She knew someone it put in bed for a long time. I, I've known other people it put in bed for two years. And, and when it got me, I'm just going to tell you, it floored me. And uh, I prayed, I prayed, and then one day God gave me a word, and it, it, and it began a healing, but it affected my personality. Most of the time, I stopped talking. We say, you're doing all right now. Well, that's under the anointing. My wife would say to me, talk. And I wouldn't talk because there was nothing to talk about. And then it would, it would put me into depression. You, you know, you're saying you're a Christian. You're a Christian? Confessing that you had a little depression? Well, if you've never had any depression, there's something wrong with you. Because depression comes when I feel bad about something and it affects me. I went into depression. I went into such tiredness that I would be driving along the road and feeling that I would drive into trees. It would come on me so heavy, I thought I was going to pass out. In fact, a couple of times I nearly did. It took me to the end of my tether. And my personality has not yet been fulfilled back. And I suddenly realized the other thing it left me with was edginess. So like, you know, I'll go back to Danny and say, can you quieten it down a bit? And some of you say, no, we like it loud then please sit in my seat and I'll sit at the back because loud noises make me do that. If you slam a cup, it makes me do that. I'm at the end of my tether. Either God helps me or I'm not going anywhere. And it was God who began to help me. And don't lie and say that's never happened to me because you're never going to get what God, His strength is perfected. You might have run into something that you fight morally. You might have inherited something from your family. You might find a temptation that weighs on you. There might be an issue with, with the, you, you might have a drink issue, a food issue. And sometimes, not being funny, people switch one to the other. And sometimes you're just at the end of it. But the Lord says, in that moment, I need you in that moment to let me in. Right there. That's it. Stop being so big for your boots and tell me what's going on. Acknowledge me in all your ways, Proverbs 3, verse 6. Tell me what's going on. Because right there is where I can get in the middle of it. See, that's where our testimony is. Our testimony is, no, I overcame it by the confessions of myself. No, you overcame it because you hit the bottom. You're at the end of the tether. The rope is pulled and you say, God, help. He said, now I'm in. My strength, my power is perfected in your weakness. Now the word perfected there is really good. It means I can come to you in your weakness and bring you to completion. I can accomplish more in your weakness than you can in your strength. So in other words, I have an antidote, says the Lord, for those moments. I pray we'll always remember this. This gets good in a moment. It's good enough now, really. I pray that watching and here you'll never, even if you're fighting COVID right now in weakness, call on him in his strength. Say, I can't overcome this in myself. I know when I caught the first one that nearly took us out, I, I said it every I needed prayer. I couldn't confess my way out. I wanted help. And folks, at those moments... These are the ways of God. If we learn the ways of God, we've got, we're going to go somewhere. All right? But it's not the fact that we've invited him. Now he tells us the antidote. I can work in this. If you'll be real. If you'll let me in now. But the most important point now comes. How do we respond 
in these moments. See, Paul, if I were to read it to you, but time doesn't allow it, Paul then says, then, if that's right, if God just said that to me, if that's right, then I am glad that God has taken me to such a place so that He can magnify His glory. In fact, I'll rejoice in the persecutions and the weaknesses and the attacks because I know it will bring His glory. Most of us don't like that bit there. What he really said is, I'll embrace the weakness so I can embrace the answer. And the moment I get the answer, the glory of God will turn up. But if you don't embrace it, you see, there's something in our Western culture that we would rather fight that and confess our way out of that. Can I just tell you something? If you keep trying to be so clever, he'll take you to the end of your tether. It's not what you can do. It's only what he can do. And I believe in confession. Well, what Paul said, I'll embrace this, I'll embrace this, I'll embrace this. I need you. There's nowhere else to go. Miracles don't happen on how clever I am. Miracles happen when your power gets released, and your power gets released when I embrace the thing. The amount of stories I've read of fathers, you talk about Father's Day. We all think that Father's and Mother's Day, I don't know why the church has to fulfill the world's days. Do you know that some fathers don't want Father's Day because their kids are away and don't even talk to them. Some mothers grieve at Mother's Day. They want anything but Mother's Day. But the church always has to embrace it, doesn't it? See? And, you know, a father grieving is at the end of his tether. A mother broken as at the end of it, someone from New York sent me a picture today. And this is a guy from New York whose son became so sick. And he literally took on, uh, how do I say it rightly? He took on some, some, some mental problems. And as a result, went away from God. I was invited to speak in this large church in, in, in the area in Connecticut. And for a favor to his dad, he turned up in the church. And then when nobody else was there, he sat and talked to me about all that was going on. The dad sent me a picture today. His son was on the second row watching. You see, at the end of his tether, God moved. You've got to hear this. I know it's affecting everybody, but, but we got to... You see, now, how do I respond? Paul responds right. Now watch Peter. Can you imagine this? Toiled all night. Nothing. Nada. Crian. That's the French bit. Nothing. Who would want to go back out fishing when you've caught nothing? The worst time for any performer is when he fails and fails and fails. The worst time for any soccer player, any football player, it doesn't matter, he misses every catch. He doesn't want to go back on the field. But the best thing to do is go back on the field. But with someone else in control. So when Jesus steps into the boat, he says, do you mind? He doesn't even say, do you mind? He just gets in the boat. You invited him in. You said, I want you to be my Savior. He said, yeah, there's more to it. You invited Savior, I'm the Lord. You invited the whole package. He steps into the vessel. Will you let him in the vessel? Will you give him the right to take over the situation? Or will you fight? Then he tells him what to do. He takes command of Peter's vessel. It's my boat. You don't tell me what to do with my boat. But he just did. He said, I want to go out there a little bit and talk to the people. Your boat, me in your boat, I take command. The moment you hit this and say, Lord, I give you the right to be Lord, anything can go on. But if you only want Jesus the Savior, you're going to, why don't you just chairlift to heaven quick? I got saved, get me out of here. No, I got saved, bring the Lord in here. Because now he's taken command, but will I let him take command? And here's another problem. He wants to now minister from your vessel. 
Now, you've got to get this. He wants to minister from you. But here's the hint. If he gets to minister from you, he'll minister to you. Because when Peter allows him to minister from the boat, then he turns around and ministers to Peter in the boat. And you've got to give the Lord permission in these hours. Well, I'm at the end of a tether. I've told all night, nothing's worked. What are you doing? I'm just being me. You let me in the boat. You let me take command. You let me minister. Anything can start to happen. Yeah, but I don't feel good enough, as you'll see in a minute, for you to minister. I don't feel like I've succeeded enough. No, 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 you've not got it. You're not supposed to have succeeded enough. He has succeeded enough. Amen. He stepped into your... Yeah, but I'm a mess. He knows it. Yep. I've got more broken noses from falling flat on my face than anyone. I told you the story. You know, my mom was 97 when she passed. And she never told me till she was 96 how I broke my nose. I always look in the mirror and keep saying, there's something a bit wrong. That's why if you take a picture, I always say this side's better. Because the nose is shorter on this side than this side. And what happened is my nose broke. And I only found out when she was 96 how my nose broke. What, what's wrong with this picture? Could you have not told me? She said, you were such a naughty boy. <laughs> that helps. Thank you. She said, you would never do as you were told. Really? I can't see that. <laughs> and then she said... You would stand, you know the old prams? Any of you that are old, remember the old prams? She said, you used to stand up in the pram, and it was before they had those little things to attach. She said, I kept saying, sit down, sit. No, you wouldn't sit down. You always had to be standing up. There's a personality trait, yeah. right? And, and she said, you wouldn't listen. So one day you stood up, and before I could catch you, out you went. Bang, straight on your face. That's why I look like this. A bit like Henry the Cooper. Remember Henry Cooper? You should remember Henry Cooper. He knocked out Muhammad Ali. And in those days, if the, if the bell ring went, you, he, you couldn't count him out. Today you can. But whenever they interviewed him, he like this. Why did he like that? I thought like this. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. I, I love the interviews. Henry, what do you do? You're not getting it, are you? Some of you look like Henry Cooper. <laughs> and you should. Because you've tried it so many times. You've fallen flat on your face so many times. That God in his goodness didn't allow your nose to end up like Henry Cooper's or like mine. But you've got a flat nose in God. But it, will you let him take over in the middle of this thing? You know, the only thing I, I, I've always hated in life and since I've really been born again and walked with the Lord, and you know when you get over the arrogance of the fact that God used you? Have you ever had that arrogance when God, you laid your hand on the first person, they got healed or whatever, and you got a prophecy that proved to be true and you're thinking, wow, pretty good there. And, and you do it for a little while and then you find out if he doesn't speak, you don't speak. If he doesn't touch, nobody gets touched. But, you know, the first person you prayed for and there's anointing, you keep your hand out of the bath in case you wash off the anointing. <laughs> but, folks, you've got to get rid of that. Because yeah. if you don't, he's going to get you to the end of another tether. Yeah. So that I find out who it is. I've got to let him be Lord of my life. I feel like sometimes people don't let anyone be Lord of their life. They're still so busy trying to run their lives you know it's it's weird to me that we get born again we don't know anything but because we're westerners we think we know everything and we use the word discipleship and someone says i don't need discipleship well why wouldn't you need discipleship yeah because because i'm the managing director of a company who needs to tell me what to do yeah but you're a managing director of that company not this one the managing director just stepped into the boat now, this is what he wants to do. Here's, here's the big push. He then says to Peter, now I'm in. Now you're allowing me to take over. Will you launch out into the deep? We brought this up on Thursday, but this is the big minute in anybody's life. Will you let Jesus take you out of your comfort zone? How many of you know you don't know how much you live in it? Because 
comfort zone is me ministering in that which I know. Comfort zone is me walking in the realm, and yet I'm taken to the end of my tether. I can't do it anymore. Why? Because he wants to upgrade my experience. He wants to upgrade my flow. He wants to take me where I've never been. How many of you want to go there, or you just want to just stay? I just want to stay where I am till I get to heaven. Oh, please go there. Because why wouldn't you want all that God has to manifest, even if he brings you to the end? One of the ways of God is he brings you to the end. Now will you launch into the deep? Now will you go where you can't control it? I know when God brought us over from England, it was, it was very hard, you know. How many of you know that this culture is not the same as the British culture? Have you, does anybody know that? Uh, Julie's away, but she would say the same about the Philippines. He would say the same about Mexico. And, and you, you know that wherever you are, you think you're the best. You, you know that, don't you? But how many of you know that when God says launch into the deep, he takes you from what you think is the best and throws you to something that is better because you have to rely on him to go there. So whether you come, like you're nodding from there, but whether you come from the northeast, whether you come from the northwest, whether you come from Hawaii, I would never come from Hawaii. There's something wrong with that one. Whether you come from Alaska, whether you come from Ireland, wherever it is you come from, God says, no, that's, that's comfort zone. You can do that. See, it's easy to preach if you're anointed to preach, but it's not easy to prophesy if you've never prophesied. It's easy to prophesy if you've always prophesied, but it's not easy to get a vision of someone that's healed unless you're forced into another arena. And then who's got the guts to speak? So suddenly he throws you into this arena and says, look, I got so much more. You got brought to the end of your tent, but I've toiled all night but caught nothing. Yeah, because we're going somewhere you've never been. You went in the natural way. I'm going, I'm calling fish to the boat. What I'm about to do with you, you've never done. And it was only that when you came to the end of your tether, I could get you here. Will you let me take you there? Master, I toiled all night. Jesus should have said, yeah, I know that. That's why I chose your boat. But I wanted to show you what happens when I come in at the end of the tether. And what I want you to do is cast your nets down. And Peter's very reticent. He's already looked like an idiot all night. And now we're going to look like an idiot again. And I bet, I bet with all my heart, I bet inside his mind he went, he doesn't know anything. I know he's a good teacher. What does he know about fishing? Come on, you didn't think he went, oh God, yes, I just feel so good. I'm so graced that you are in the boat. I'll just do whatever you say. He said, Master, I've toiled all night. But because you say so, it's on you. If this goes wrong, it's on you. <laughs> I love it. He drops down the net. The net's too big to pull up the fish. And he falls to his knees and says, oh, my God, I'm a sinful man. Why? Because God revealed who he was in the midst of it, and he saw who he was in the midst of it, and was prepared to admit in the midst of it, I can't do this. Only you can do this. I give me up. I give up my future. I will yield to where you're going. I don't care who you are and what you are, whether you're young or you're old, I tell you, God will take you here. He's taken me here as a church leader. He's taken me here as a ministry. We've been there as husband and wife. We've been there as parents. And if you're not there, God will take you there. Now, here comes the results. The results were that, that Paul stepped into another level of God. The results were that Paul stopped relying on anything he'd seen before, but relied nothing else but the power and the grace of God. In other words, he said yes to grace. Now you get this. I'm sick. I need grace. I need a new job. I need grace. 
I'm in trouble. I need grace. I've run out of money. I need grace. I'm tempted. I need grace. I can't do it, but I have found out who can. So I, I invite grace, your grace, not my grace, your grace. I invite it into the middle of my life. And from now on, everything I walk into, I'm looking for a grace that comes from you because your grace is sufficient. There's nothing I can walk into now that I do not rely on your grace. I call on your grace. I ask for your grace. See, it's all right nodding your head to a truth. It's another thing, walking a truth. And you could have watched Paul from then on. He starts to pray, grace, oh grace, oh grace. Oh Lord, I, I, I'm in a realm I can't walk into. I need a new grace. And the second thing that he starts to touch, that he confesses his weakness and he's glad about his weakness because he knows every time the weakness comes up, he calls for the power of God. He said, Lord, I just found out your ways. That when I confess my weakness, it releases your power. When I say, Lord, I can't do it, the, the dunamis of God. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to check church history out. Don't read about people who are goody, goody, two-shoes people. Read about real people. And you'll find every one of them had issues. And when they were in their issues, at their weakest, God did the greatest things. If you ever meet them, they'll confess, I am so intimidated. I feel I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. And in those moments, the glory of God would turn up. And don't be intimidated by people. Nobody, can I say this in God, nobody is better than you. Well, you don't know my weaknesses. You don't know theirs. Sometimes because of my gift, I do know theirs. But it makes no difference. It's you and God and He wants to take you the whole way. Yes. So watch this. Paul walks into a new level. Wow. Now watch Peter. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Don't worry about it. Done deal. But from now on, I want you to be one of my disciples. I want to teach you how to be the fishers of men. I want you to follow me. I want you to be the one who's got the worst foot and mouth disease ever recorded in the Bible. Your big mouth will never shut because you don't know how to shut it. But worry not, I've already forgiven it and it's going to go all the way through. But you're going to be the one that when the glory falls will stand up in front of everybody because you know what weakness is. No, oh, listen, listen, it doesn't excuse your weakness. Well, thank God, I can just carry on as I am. No, 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 no. We're not after carrying on as we are. We're after coming to him in the middle of it. And as a result of Paul and Peter accepting that moment, listen to what happened. Peter lived in the deep. He never went back to the shallows again. He lived in the deep. He lived in the risk of walking with the Holy Spirit. He lived under the anointing of the one that met him. How many of us want to live in the deep where God's got you all the way? Big moan, isn't it? So if you didn't like the word tether, it's your rope. If you don't want a rope, it's your lead. But whatever it is, God will take you to the end of it. I walked in here this morning before anybody was here. You know, before some of the, the early birds had even risen. And I walked in here and I said, my God, I want to talk to you about what's going on. I want to confess my reactions. I want to bring it before you. It wasn't seconds before that, that great touch of God settled. Why? Because that's all he wanted to hear. I'm learning to invite him into my weaknesses. Every time one manifests. I believe, my friends, if I can bring this to a head, I believe it's a sign of a man or a woman of God. You see, so many people I meet don't want to ever confess they do anything. Have you noticed that there's people that you meet that everybody else is wrong, but they're never sorry? Then stay in the level you're in. 
But don't look at other people and say, well, I can't equal that. Listen, you can equal whatever God takes you to. Any of you can have something new in God if you will come to the end of your tether. Isn't it funny that some people have to retire before they find out that they need God? Isn't it funny that other people have to be on their sickbed before they find out they need God? It said of John Wayne that as he was dying, he confessed Christ. But why did he have to wait that long? Why did, you don't have to wait that long. I don't have to wait that long. And I told the Lord this morning, I'm just going to tell you what I told the Lord this morning. I don't like getting older. But Lord, I thank you for the grace to walk in. I don't like the aches and pains, but I thank you, Lord, for the, the grace to walk in. It seems to me that your promise is the weaker I am, the more you can do. Why have I got to get to that age before I let God have his way? Why can't I do it now? Why can't I do it at your age, Roger? You can do it at your age. Some of the greatest men of God did it young, said, oh my God, I've got it. If I go my way, it's not going to work. But oh, right now, I yield to what's going on. But God will take us to the tether to move us on. Sometimes we're dumb. You know, you know that, don't you? Uh, please, please acknowledge as I'll get a word on you. Right. <laughs> I just worry about people that, no, I'm not dumb. Until you, his wife says. But where we live, we, we live a little out in the country that is trying to follow us now already. And, and almost all the fields where we live, there's donkeys. And they're always on their own. I, I don't get this. Donkeys always. And they're not the most intelligent fellas. But, you know, it doesn't sit and say, I'm not a donkey. I'm actually a horse. You don't know that, but I know that. <coughs> Just watch me, I'm a horse. No, he's a donkey. And he, he, he acknowledges he's a donkey, but Jesus didn't come riding on a horse, he came riding on a donkey. Because the donkey was humble enough to let Jesus on his back. He didn't want to look magnificent, he wanted to look real. I'll pray it went somewhere. Because it's up to you now, isn't it? You can say, well, that, that was rather boring. Well, if it's boring, I just prophesy tether coming. No, it's not boring. It's real. And it might happen today. It might happen tomorrow. It might, but don't give up now. Say, oh, God, I invite you into this. Oh, God, I'm bringing you in because I want the fullness of Christ. I want the lordship of Christ. I want the, the hand of God magnifying himself. Lift your hands with me. I stood praying for a man one day. As I stood praying for the man one day, I didn't know what he'd walk, but I sensed it was tough. As I stood praying for him and, and was ministering to him, I heard a sound. It was so loud. And I heard the Lord slamming a dungeon door closed. And as he slammed the dungeon door closed, I heard the Lord say, I have shut down the past. You can never be taken back there. Because the man had lived in the weakness of his past. And I want to say something in the spirit. God is shutting the doors of your yesterday. You do not need, says the Lord, any more rehearsing to me of what you walked through. I was there. I saved you from it. I shut the door on it. But now I'm asking for the right to walk in the vessel in my fullness. To take you where you say you can't go at the end of your tether. And I want you to invite the Lord and say, Lord, from this moment on, breathe in my life. I want, I want you know, Jack standing up right there. Jack, because he wrote me and told me, I want the people around him, I want you just to, your hands are right there. Put your hands on his back. Listen to the word of the Lord. There's, a, there's always a new day and there's always a new beginning. And you could rehearse what you think went on or what you don't think went on. But the Lord says there's an always a new day and there's always a new beginning. And you heard this today for you so that I could open a new door for you. I am not the, I'm not the door closer that is not a door opener. 
So I want you guys to pray this. Favor upon that man. All of you, favor upon that man. Until he smiles. Is there anybody else in here that feels you need some new doors opening in your lives? All right, look, look, look. Your dad's there. Could you pray from behind? Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Favor upon that man that everything that God has for him. Anybody else? Anybody put your hand up. I would like some favor on my life. So I want someone near to them just to touch them and put favor upon their lives. Favor and new beginnings. Favor and new beginnings. New days. Anybody over here? Don't say I'm perfected because you don't look at it perfected. So Larry, hear a word of the Lord. I just looked over at you and the Lord spoke to me. He said, say this to him, that the end of an era is coming. And as the end of the era comes, have faith that I will step in and the end of an era is coming. But as the end of an era comes, I'm going to move you into something that you have not been in before. No longer will you be held in the grasp of men, but you'll be held in the grasp of God. And the Lord says, don't don't settle for second best as the end of the era comes. Because when I move you into the new, the new is going to be something about me and you. And you're going to find out things about yourself you never knew that I know. And you could probably say, well, what is that? That's the point. I don't know. I just know what the Lord told me. I feel an anointing. Lord, let the anointing fall on this man. Let the anointing fall on him right now the depth of it come right through his soul that he will actually know the anointing stand in places you've never stood minister in ways you've never done it I'm going to give you a shot I just touched you and the Lord says I've already given him little visions but he's not too sure of himself so I'm actually prophesying to you that the Lord's going to open your visionary box and you're going to start to see things that you've never seen so that you can proclaim things that you've never done. It will start with your family, but it will go a lot further than that. In fact, you could be a great aid to those that minister in the Spirit because of the things you'll see if you'll receive it. Draw me, Lord. So all I want you to do is now, because we promise not to touch too many people because of the situation that's going on, I want you to lift up your hand and say, Draw me, Lord. I want you to bring whatever that is that the tether is tight at, whether it's sickness, whether it's job, whether it's relationships, whether it's money. I want you to bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, here's the tether. It's right at the end. But I'm inviting you in. I want your grace right now. I invite your Lordship in. Are Are you feeling something in the realm? Something in the atmosphere is coming down. All it is is Lordship. I'm inviting you, Lordship. That's twice today he's come down. Corporate deficit. I receive. I'm not going to speak this over anybody. I'm going to speak it into the air. I uh, suddenly heard, as I I stepped over here, I just suddenly heard this sound, a door banging like this. And when I I looked into it in the spirit, it wasn't a door that was closing. It it was a revolving door that kept moving like this. And I I sense that there's somebody in here that feels like you're caught in a revolving door. It's doing this. But I want to tell you that the Lord says, I'm going to give you the skill to walk through that door. Because every time you try to do something, it looks like the door closes on you. But the Lord says, it's a revolving door. I'm going to give you the right and the ability to walk through this door. And you're going to step in to that which men said you couldn't have. I see the word contracts, contracts, uh, contracts that you've been waiting on uh, uh, keep, keep seeming like shutting. The Lord says it's actually a revolving door. 
And I'm going to give you the ability to, to hear and to see and to grasp and to walk through what would say no. In fact, I want to prophesy that into the air. It's very big. The word no doesn't mean no. The word no means stand. Because when you hear what men say, you'll never do it. But if you rely on me, watch what I will do when the no of man comes in. So what I'm going to do, I'm not, I can minister to people, but I feel to just say, this is ours to do. feel standing over this way speaking very carefully I feel to say that the bluff of men is not the truth of God and when men bluff the Lord says I have truth and blow through with the breath of God the bluff of men to see the truth of God to Jack that the larger guy I've lost your name with the green shirt on Eric I just looked over at you and I felt the compassions of the Lord I don't know what your circumstances are but I know you've been walking in them the Lord said I didn't save you to hopelessness but I saved you to purpose where you're wringing your own hands and saying, Lord, I don't know if I can go on. He says, no, if you'll invite me, I can take you on. And he said, what looks hopeless is not hopeless at all. Because I'm going to step into something that seems impossible. And I want to say this to you. you your future is so in the Lord that your past will be a distant memory. Because you've been haunted by it. Holy Spirit, fall on him. Fall on him. Let him know the comfort of God. I really feel it, the anointing sitting on me. So it obviously wants to come on you. Would you just finish this out with me, my friends, by, by making your own chair an altar? And yielding yourself right now, saying, Lord, I, I invite you into the vessel. And I want you to have your way. Well, I feel your presence, Lord, here in this place. Oh, I feel your anointing, Lord. Oh, it wants to invade. So I say yes. Oh, I say yes. Oh, I say yes to you, Lord. Oh, I yield to you. I give all to you. Oh, your presence, oh, Lord. Oh, have your way. Oh, have your say. Oh, come and stay, oh, Lord. I yield all to you and what you can do. I yield all to you, my Lord. Oh, take me further. Oh, take me higher. Oh, cause me to see what you want me to see. 
Oh, open my eyes. Oh, open my ears. Oh, give me all that you want me to be. I say yes. I don't know much, guys, but I do know that there's a strange presence of God in here. I think God's just personally ministering to people. Putting hope onto you. Opening your eyes to see a future that I can walk with you, Lord. I believe that the grace of God wants to fill the place. I believe that the, the dynamis of God wants to move in our weakness. I am literally seeing businesses being birthed in the Spirit. And I want to say this to you from the Lord, that some of you are working for others when actually God wants you to be one that works for Him and employs others. I want you to, right now, as we close out, everything that looks hopeless, right now, say, Lord, no, no, that's not hopeless. I'm bringing you in. Holy Spirit, seal it in me. person that has migraine headaches and they come down the right side of your head I want you to lay hands on your head right now and I pray in the name of Jesus I pray in the name of Jesus that you would be healed right now that other person you're battling you don't just have, have moments of depression you're battling depression I'm not going to call you out. We're not going to single you out. But you just put your hand on your heart and say, my God, and I just speak life, life, life to you. That person in here who's got damage in your right ear. Just put your hand on your ear and we say, let the healing begin. That person in here who's been told about your heart. And there's some heart issues. I just want to speak life to your heart. I want to speak life to your veins. I want to speak life to your arteries. There's another person in here. I think it's the right foot. There's, there's something going on in your right foot and the bone over the arches of your right foot. I speak healing to you. And all you do is grasp it. Take it. <coughs> Hallelujah. I mean, you know if it was you, I'm not putting on a show. There's one more person I want to call out. There's someone that's been told some grievous things about your eyes. And I want to speak life to you right now. Be healed. I can't even say the word. It's molecular something. And I just want to say right now, in the name of Jesus, that be reversed. We launch out into the deep with you. As we close out, anybody feel that they want a renewal of the Spirit of God? Put your hands up. We're not going to lay hands on people today just because of what's going on. We'll take a week or two for it to go. But right now, you just lift your hands and say, Lord, I want a, a renewal of God. I want the Holy Spirit to renew me. Then I release it to you. Everything I get, I give away. I release it to you. I see your daughter standing there. I'm sorry, I can't control what's going on. But every time I look at you, I hear the word destiny. And I want parents to prophesy over her every time you see her, destiny. I see her standing and, and, and being a leader among people. And take the destiny, even if you don't understand it. Just say, Lord, what your purpose is, I take it.
So, so this is the best way, just because we're trying to be thoughtful. Would you, would you just put your hands out like that and touch the people near you, just like that. Just don't, you're just on their shoulders. And I just say, just, I want you to just say, I release the life of God. Take a few minutes to do it. I release the life of God. the breath of God blow through them. Let the strength of the Most High strengthen you and raise you. I speak into your hearts. I speak into your lungs. I speak into your life and say be restored fully. In Jesus' name. Oh, God. Yeah. That man just acted as a father in this place. Reminded of Paul's words where he said, I was a father among them, right? You have a multitude of teachers, but very few fathers. And that man just acted as a father among them. Would you honor him this morning? Dennis, thank you. Thank you for being a spiritual father. Thank you for adopting us. Ooh. Lord, we just right now, just extend your hands with me. Lord, I just speak a blessing over Dennis. God, he takes hits we don't even know about. And he stands firmer than we know. And I thank you, Lord, that you're his strengthening. Lord, I thank you when he's come to the end of his rope many times over, when his tether has felt way too short, Lord, your arm was not short to say. And, Lord, you have strengthened him with might in his inner man and in his physical man more times than we can count. Lord, I thank you for doing it again. And we just speak a blessing right now over Dennis, a strengthening to him in his body, his soul, and his spirit. Lord, that you would extend him into realms he would have ever even imagined because that's just how good you are. And we, we affirm him as our spiritual father right now. We adopt him back, God. And we say thank you for the work that you're doing in him. Lord, we say, would you honor your servant, our Father, your Son, on this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great grace, we love you. We bless you, and we say thank you so much for joining us here. We dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus. You have an amazing week.